423. It's a pretty big number. It's actually a pretty impactful number when you know what it represents. <clears throat> and no, it does not represent the number of angry tweets you read yesterday about the Olympics, okay? Um, it also doesn't represent the number of minutes that it felt like the opening ceremonies took. Um, no, that number is uh, the number of minutes an average American is looking at a screen each day. Now, that's, that number is split um, almost equally between a computer screen and a mobile screen, but it represents over seven hours a day that the average American is in front of a screen. Uh, the average Hulu user, this is based on their numbers, the average Hulu user is 53 minutes a day. Average Netflix user, 3.2 hours a day. Now, these are stats from 2016. So, yeah. Um, so things have changed now uh, a little bit. All right, next number. 2,617, another really big number. Um, that is the average smartphone user touches per day. It's an average number of time that um, a, a smartphone user touches their phone. Now that includes all the swiping and the tapping and the texting and, and the picking up and the checking your hair, if you have it, um, or you know all the different things that you would do with a phone. Um, the top 10% of users, so the people who use their phone the most, it's actually 5,427 touches per day. Americans spend an average of four hours and 37 minutes per day looking at their phones, on, and it's an average of 76 phone sessions a day. 76, almost 80 phone sessions equaling over four hours a day on our phones. iPhone users unlock their phones an average of 80 times a day. Um, next, um, got a couple of numbers we're going to throw up there. Um, 200. Um, so 200 is um, the number of hours it would take to read 100 books in a year. Um, the studies have shown that the average person can read 200 to 400 words a minute. So you take that uh, word per minute average and you extrapolate it down to about a half hour to 45 minutes of reading every day. You could read about two, um, you could read 100 books in a year. That's pretty good. Um, now, 200 is a lot of hours, right? Can we admit that that's a lot of time to carve out in a year? Until you look at the next numbers. Go ahead and throw those up. 705 is the number average hours we spend on social media every year. And the next one, 2,737, the average hours watching TV. Okay? We could read a lot of books. <laughs> Um, if, we, if we wanted to. And here's the thing. I don't give these numbers. I don't share these stats to cause shame or guilt. That is not what I hope to be able to do or to make us feel bad. All right. I'm a part of this too. I have a smartphone. I have not abandoned it yet for a flip phone, although the next couple months might convince me to do that. All right, I'm, I'm with you in this. I'm an average. And I, I realize that these are American averages. We in this room are much below all of those numbers, right? This is, these are, this is everybody else, right? Um, I don't share all of this, though, to make us feel guilty or shame or to make us feel bad. I share this because I believe that where we invest our time and our attention matters in our formation and who we will become. We are being formed. <clears throat> we are constantly being formed. Whether we realize it or not, our hearts are being shaped and we are being formed by the things around us. And where we invest our time and our attention, that matters in our formation and who we are going to become. 
So with all that, I just wanted to say, hey, welcome. I'm glad you guys are here. Um, if we've not met yet, my name is Brett. Um, like Clay said, I work with our student ministries. I've been doing that for a long time. Um, I have been, I'm married. Um, I have three teenagers. They are as much as we try to be, make them not screenagers. But we have three teenagers that live with us. And that's just a little bit about me. And we've been in Wilmington for over 20 years. And... Um, just to bring us all up to speed, this summer we are doing what's called the Summer Reset, right? We started this way back in June. And the idea of this series this summer is to, we're challenging ourselves to return to what matters most. We want to challenge ourselves to do a reset. Summer is a crazy season. It's very different than the rest of the year. Um, especially if you have kids, your schedules get thrown off. Let's be honest, our traffic gets thrown off. Um, everything gets wacky here in Wilmington in the summer. And we said, what if we took the summer to reset, to stop, to breathe, to pause, and to return to what matters most, to think and consider where we are and where we want to be in our walks with God. So if you weren't here back in June and you can't remember back to those couple of weeks where Clay spoke, Clay kind of set this up for us um, over a period of two weeks. Um, he spent one week to, the, to ask what it would look like for us to reset when it comes to our walk with God. We spent a whole week talking about the fact that we have a relationship with God and we have a walk with God. And what would it look like to reset in a walk with God? And then the next week he talked about our relationships that we get to experience in community. What would it look like to reset and re-engage when it comes to the people that we want to do life with, to build community? And what I want to start off with is, is the simple truth I think all of us kind of understand, but it's helpful to be reminded, is that God designed us as relational beings. You and I have been designed to be relational, to live in relationships. It's part of our makeup. It's part of our DNA designed within who we are as human beings is this need, this desire to be in relationship, both vertically with our creator, with God, and horizontally with each other. We need relationships. We were designed to be in relationship with God and with others. And it, it, all you have to do is go back to the beginning. All you have to do is go back to Genesis and look at the description that the writer of Genesis put together. This, this poem that describes the creation of the world and God's engagement in the creation of the world to discover that we were created for relationship. Uh, Genesis 1 Verse 26 says this, Then God said, Let us make human beings in our image to be like us. Now, those words that are highlighted, is there anybody who knows what part of speech those are? No? Oh, those are pronouns. I thought maybe the nine didn't get it. Uh, I thought maybe the 11 would come through. I was an English teacher before I do what I do now. So I love grammar and I love that stuff. So those are pronouns. What's interesting about those pronouns and this verse is it starts off by saying, then God said. God is in the singular form, right? And a pronoun is something that refers back to a noun. And the pronouns that are listed there are not singular. They are Good. Okay. Yeah. You guys just, you're, you raised your grade. Good job. Um, you now have A's in, in my grammar class. Um, God is singular, but he, when he's describing himself, it's plural. Let us make man in our image to be like us. God exists from the beginning, has existed in a relationship. God exists in a relationship. God the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. He is in relationship and didn't just say, let us make man. Let's make man in our image. If God exists in relationship and we were created in his image, we were created for relationship. They will reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in, uh, uh, the birds in the sky, the livestock, all the wild animals on the earth, and the small animals that scurry along the ground. 
So God created human beings in his own plural image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. We were created in the image of God. And the image of God is relationship. We were designed. It's part of our DNA. It's part of our creation to be relational beings. Even like between each other and with God. If you know anything about the rest of the story, when the fall happens and God comes looking for them in the cool of the day, right? God comes looking for Adam and Eve because he, was, he spent time with them. He was with them. They had a relationship that was damaged. There was a relationship that they had with God and there was a relationship that they had with each other. And then again, um, if you know anything about this, the first couple chapters of the Bible, the first one kind of is this poem describing the creation of the world and chapter two kind of retells the same thing over again. And it says, in Genesis 2, verse 15, the Lord God placed man in the garden of Eden to tend and watch over it. Uh, Genesis 2, 15. And what's interesting about that, and even the verse that we just read, was that God gave us work to do. Like this, that what we're talking about today is not an escape from the work that God's called us to do. He's given us a task to partner with him in, in tending to and creating within his creation. To be a part of bringing his kingdom to bear on earth. We have work. Like we get to engage with him in work. But we also are enga to engage with him in relationship. So it goes on to say in verse 18, Then the Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper who is just right for him. We were designed for relationship. Adam was given a helper. He was given, it wasn't good for him to be alone. It's not good for us to be alone. They, we were created as relational beings designed to live in relationship vertically with God and horizontally with others. We need relationship. Now, some need relationship more than others, right? Some of us need a lot. Some of us don't need as much. And we'll get to more of that in just a minute. But all of us need relationships to thrive, to live the lives that God created us and intended for us to live. And if this is true, which I think most of us in here would agree that it is true, that we're created for a relationship for him, with him and with others. If it's true, if we were created for relationship and thrive as relational beings, the question we have to answer is how do we cultivate those relationships? What does it look like for us to develop and deepen and dwell in the relationships we were created to have both with God and with each other. And the truth is that cultivating relationships requires us to carve out time. To curate our time. To design, to be intentional in designing our days in such a way that the deepening of our relationships is possible. That there's a connection between the depth of our relationships and the amount of time that we are able to give to them. Um, so this past year, my wife and I got to take a vacation. And I will say that I'm a little embarrassed to admit that um, it was like the longest vacation we've taken together since our honeymoon 23 years ago. Um, so it was awesome. We got to go, thanks to the generosity of a lot of people made this happen, we got to go to Hawaii. For a week. Has anybody ever been to Hawaii? Yeah. If you've been to Hawaii, you know what being to Hawaii is like. It is like another, I felt like I was on another planet the whole time, let alone not in the United States. I didn't think I was in a part of this world anymore. Um, you can, I have some pictures to show. If you've never been to Hawaii, it is a mind boggling place. I remember at one point I was out on this, uh, my wife and I were out on this like lava flow that went out into the ocean and there's this like blowhole where like water gets blown up into the sky through it and there's all these waves crashing up on this lava flow and everything's gray and rocky and it looks like you're on the moon. And at one point I expected like stormtroopers to come up over the side because I was like, this is not 
our planet, right? Um, we got to, like, in, in Hawaii, you can, one morning, we did this, one morning you can be at it's 85 and you're swimming with sea turtles. You don't even have to sign up for an excursion to see, swim with sea turtles. You literally go to a beach and start swimming and they, like, come up to you and you have to, like, get away out of their way. Um, they're very curious. So that morning we're, like, swimming with sea turtles and then we drove up like 10,000 feet up into this crater where it's like 40 degrees out and then you stay there until the stars come out and you see this amazing sunset and the stars come out. We saw waterfalls. We drove the road to Hana, which is like very scary. Um, but you see all these amazing sights and these waterfalls. We hiked up into this valley. You see there on that last picture. Um, and you're hiking up into the clouds. Like you're in the clouds and you turn around and you look out and you see the ocean. It's like amazing. And when I came back, everybody wanted to, so how was Hawaii? What was Hawaii like? What was, what was the best part of your trip? In full, full honesty, the absolute best part, the only answer I could give to ans fully answer that question, the best part of Hawaii was the time I got to spend with my wife. And I, I don't say that for the reaction. <laughs> Thank you for that. She's in the room. Um, no, like at the end of the day, we got to experience all of these things together and we hadn't done that, that amount of time together, just the two of us in 20 plus years. There's a connection and our relational depth that only can happen because of the time. We spent seven days together experiencing all that. That was the best part. There is an there is a undeniable connection between our time and our relationships. The depth and quality of our relationships are directly tied to the amount of time that we are willing to invest in them. And here's the thing, there's a, um, none, of this, none of what I'm saying is a surprise to any of us, right? We, we, none of, nothing is groundbreaking in what I'm saying. My guess is most of us in here would agree with what I've said so far. Um, it's not earth-shattering to talk about how we were wired to be in relationship with others. I think we all kind of get that. It's not mind-blowing, especially here in church, uh, to talk about how we were designed to be in relationship with God and community with others who followed Jesus. We all want these things. We want to have deeper relationships. We desire community with others. We want a relationship with God. It's why we're here. You've given up in an hour of your day, and it's gorgeous outside, right? To be in a place to grow in your relationship with God and with others. So none of this is surprising. The tension is our time. We know that relationships require time, energy, and attention. And we don't need me to remind us that time is something that we just don't feel like we have enough of. My guess is that very few of us in this room, if any of us, feel as though we have enough time to do all the things that we need to do. Let alone all the things that we want to do. Let alone all the things that we know we should do that are really, really good for us. Nobody in this room is like, yeah, all the time in the world. God, I got plenty of time. I'm looking for stuff to do. You know, we all are busy. We all have a ton of stuff going on in our lives. What I'm subject suggesting here, as we examine the time that we have to invest our relationships with God and with other people, is not is not that we find a way to add one more thing to our already busy and crowded schedules. It's not what I'm suggesting. None of us really has the time to add another thing into what we already have going on. What I am suggesting is that we reevaluate where we are investing our time and ask ourselves where, if we were truly honest with ourselves and where we spend our time, where can we start saying no so that we can start saying yes to the things that really matter most. That's a reset. A reset is being honest and saying, where do I need to say no so that I can say yes? To reset ourselves to what we know matters most, we're going to have to learn to say no to some things or to eliminate some things from our lives so that we can say yes to time spent with Jesus and building the kind of Christ-centered community that we were built for and we actually desire. If we don't, 
if we don't do that, if we, we refuse to reevaluate where we invest our time, where it matters most, our spiritual lives and our critical relationships will suffer as we give way to the culture of busyness in which we live. I want to read a quote uh, from a man named um, Ronald Rollheiser. Um, he wrote a book. Um, it's called Sacred Fire, A Vision for a Deeper Human and Christian Maturity. In this book, uh, this, this quote is very convicting. It was convicting to me, and, and it, I think it's so true. He says this. He says, Today, a number of historical circumstances are blindly flowing together and accidentally conspiring to produce a climate within which it is difficult not just to think about God or to pray, but simply to have any interior depth whatsoever. I do have to say I would disagree with him in this one point because I do not think it's random. I don't think that these things are blindly flowing together. I actually do believe that there is a world and there is a power in this world that is actually orchestrating the busyness and the pressure that we feel in our lives to distract us from the thing that matters most in our relationship with God. He goes on to say, We, for every kind of reason, good and bad, are distracting ourselves into spiritual oblivion. It's not that we have anything against God, depth, and spirit. We would like these. It's just that we are habitually too preoccupied to have any of these show to on top of our radar screens. We are more busy than bad, more distracted than non-spiritual, and more interested in the movie theater, the sports stadium, and the shopping mall. Or I would maybe say uh, in Netflix, or Instagram, or Facebook, or work, or our busy schedules, and a vast number of other things. We're more interested in what, than the fantasy life they produce in us, than we are in the church. Pathological busyness, distraction, and restlessness are major blocks today within our spiritual lives. Is that not true? You know, Mike, um, our, our senior pastor, uh, has been saying this line um, for years, uh, decades since I've been coming to this church. Um, it's actually something that his youth pastor used to tell him when he was in youth group. You've probably heard him say it before if you've been here any length of time. And he says this, if you are too busy to spend time with God, then you are busier than God wants you to be. If we are too busy to spend time with God, we're busier than God actually wants us to be. He desires a relationship. He desires us to be with him. He desires us to grow deeper in relationship with him and with others. And if we're too busy for that, we're actually too busy. We're busier than he wants us to be. And I'd like to rewrite that statement for today. If we are too busy to spend time with God and building community, then we are busier than God designed us to be. We were not designed to run at the pace at which we run. We were not, does the human body, the human being, the human consciousness was not designed to sustain the pace at which most of us live our lives. Because it does not create in us true life and it doesn't give us the time and the space and the energy to invest in the relationships, both with God and with others that matter most. The call to live in relationship with God and with others is the call for us to reset our connections by getting real about where we're investing our time and consciously deciding to invest this precious commodity in the places where it will have the most impact. That's our call. So the question is, how do we do it? What do we do? Let's get real about how do we apply this if it's true. Again, none of this is groundbreaking. It's not earth shattering. We know this to be true. We know we're designed for a relationship with God and with others. We know that we're way too busy. We know that we use our time in ways that is not helpful. What do we do? So I want you to this week to ask yourself three questions. I, I would challenge you to spend time this week actually asking these questions. Like, write down, think through, and think through these three questions. They are this. How am I wired? What is my stage of life? And what do I enjoy? 
What would it look like to stop and just ask these questions today when it comes to like, hey, if we're like, okay, we want to reset. We want to reset. We want to reset our connections and our time with, with God and with others. I think it starts by answering these questions. First of all, what is your, how are you wired? What is your personality? God has designed each of us with a unique personality and a unique wiring. Some of us in this room are more unique than others, and that's okay. But we're all unique and we're all designed specifically to be the person that God created us to be. What is your personality? One of the big questions is, are you introverted or extroverted? Where do you get your energy? Does being in a room of people and being a around people energize you. Great. If it doesn't, if you're more introverted and you get energy from being on your own or being getting time on your own and being quiet, great. What is your personality? How are you wired when it comes to relationships with others and relationships with God? We, were all, we all need to be around people, right? We all have to have relationships with some need it more than others. And that's okay. Just get real with how God's wired you. Um, if you are someone who, like my children, struggle with ADD and keeping, staying and paying attention, sitting for long periods of time in deep conversation or reading your Bible, it may be difficult to do. That's okay. It doesn't mean we're let off the hook and we don't do those things. We don't push ourselves in those areas, but you need to be aware. What is your personality? How have you been wired? Are you a morning person or a night person? Listen, there is nothing more spiritual about doing your quiet time in the morning than it is about doing it at another point of the day. I think for a long time we felt like we had to just get up in the morning and that's just, you do your quiet time in the morning. It's the first thing you do. For me in the way that I'm wired, that is how I'm wired. I am good in the morning. I am not good at night. Um, my wife is totally different. She is great at night and will stay up late and does not want to get up in the morning. It's okay. You just have to decide how you're wired. There's nothing more spiritual about doing it in the morning. Um, you know, you read books about people 200 years ago that got up at four in the morning to pray and spend time with God. The reason they did that was because they went to bed at seven when the sun went down. Okay? That's just when they had the time in the morning. But you got to figure out your wiring. Ask that question. How am I wired? As you discover and learn more about the, and lean more, sorry, into the unique way that God has wired you, I believe you will discover unique ways that you will be able to connect relationally with him and with others. Next, what is my stage of life? Are you married or single? That's a big difference in the amount of time, right, that we have to invest. And it changes the relationship in which you need to invest, right? Being married versus being single. It's a stage of life thing. Um, are you pre-kids? Are you mid-kids? Are you mid-teens, which can we be honest, is a different than being mid-kids mid to be mid-teens, right? Amen. Um, or post-kids, like, what's your stage of life? All of those different stages are going to cre create and require different, different amounts and of energy and time. And it's okay. You just have to acknowledge it and be real with it. Are you college, high school, or middle school? And you feel busy. Let me be honest with you. You're not busy, but you might feel busy, all right, right? Just pay attention. Um, pay attention to what is good. What stage of life are you in? Um, I, I read a stat um, that uh, the average male will spend 10,000 hours playing video games by the time he is 21. You've got time. Um, and isn't it funny that 10,000 hours is actually the amount of time that most experts say it takes to become an expert at something? Um, so you could reinvest that and become an expert in um, microbiology if you wanted to in your, when you're in middle school. Um, maybe not. But here's the thing. We all have, we have, we have different stages of life. So each stage of life is going to present unique challenges and opportunities to adjust your time for building relationships. Last, what do I enjoy? A relationship with others and a relationship with God is something that we were, to, we were to enjoy. It should bring joy. It should bring freedom to our lives. If you don't enjoy getting up in the morning and reading for hours at a time, that's okay. What is it that you enjoy? And what would it look like for you to incorporate your relationship with God and others into things that you already enjoy? Do you enjoy being outside? Do you enjoy exercising? Do you enjoy reading? Do you enjoy, I mean, what do you, what brings you joy? Um, Matt Chandler said, what's, they asked this question, what stirs my affections for God? And for every one of us, that's different. 
right? In the morning when I get up to pray and to read my Bible, I go to bed the night before excited about the cup of coffee I get to drink the next morning, okay? I enjoy coffee. That's okay. I like, it's like, it's my Bible and a book and a journal and a cup of coffee. And it doesn't even have to be good coffee. It could literally be a K-cup and I'm excited about it, okay? I know some of you need higher quality, okay? Uh, I don't. What do you enjoy? Um, Reading, writing, journaling. Do you enjoy silence? Do you enjoy music? Do you enjoy one-on-one? Do you thrive in one-on-one conversations or a small group of people? Or do you enjoy being in a large group of people? What would it look like to do the thing that you enjoy and to incorporate God in your relationship with him? Whether you call it quiet time, time with God, prayer time, devotions, or practicing God's presence. You have to set aside time to practice. When it comes to my relationship with God, over the last year and a half, I have made a commitment knowing my wiring and knowing how I've been designed to get up in the mornings and prioritize to carve out time to practice God's presence. One of the things that I have found that's been most helpful to me in the way that I'm wired is actually praying a written out prayer. Uh, I was reading a book by a, name, a pastor and writer named Brian Zond, and it's kind of telling his story. Um, and he talks about um, a chapter on prayer, and he actually wrote out a, a, like a liturgy of morning prayer. It's multiple pages long. So I wrote that all out word for word in my journal and I spend time literally just reading a prayer. Reading a prayer and reciting a prayer is not less spiritual. I think it's liturgical in a way that helps us become formed to who God wants us to be. In fact, the early church, the, the, we have a book of prayer in our Bible. It's called the Psalms that we can pray and we can read through and we can read out loud. The early church said they'd spent time devoted to one another and to prayer. There are some translations that say they spent time devoted to the prayers that they were prayers that they would pray together. It's okay to pray. And we're, gonna, we're actually going to practice this right now. One of the parts of, the, of um, that prayer that I've been reading is an expanded version of the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer, the disciples asked Jesus to teach them one thing. And the one thing, they, the only thing that's recorded that they asked Jesus to teach them was how to pray because they observed Jesus praying so much. They asked how to pray, and Jesus didn't just give them a model for prayer. He actually said, pray this. When you pray, pray this. And this is an expanded version. The question I have is, what would it look like for us to carve out the time to actually dwell on and pray this? And we're going to do it together, out loud, right now. Okay, so it'll be on the screens. If you have the notes, it's on there. Let's pray this together. Let's practice the time. Our Father, Holy Father, Abba Father, in the heavens, hallowed, holy, sacred be your name. From the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. The whole earth is full of your glory. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thy government come, thy politics be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thy reign and rule come, thy plans and purposes be done on earth as it is in heaven. May we be an anticipation of the age to come. May we embody the reign of Christ here and now. Give us day by day our daily bread. Provide for the poor among us. As we seek first your kingdom and your justice, may we all, all need, sorry, may all we need be provided for us. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. 
Transform us by the Holy Spirit into a forgiving community of forgiven sinners. Lead us not into trouble, trial, tribulation, or temptation. Be mindful of our frame. We are but dust. We can only take so much. Lead us out of the wilderness into the promised land that flows with milk and honey. Lead us out of the bad lands into resurrection country. Deliver us from evil and the evil one. Save us from Satan, the accuser and adversary, so that no weapon formed against us shall prosper, so that every tongue that rises against us in accusation you will condemn, so that every fiery dart of the wicked one is extinguished by the shield of faith, so that as we submit to you and resist the devil, the devil flees, so that as we draw near to Jesus Christ lifted up, his cross becomes for us the axis of love expressed in forgiveness that refounds the world. And the devil, who became the false ruler of the fallen world, is driven out from among us. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Two and a half minutes. I timed it out. It takes two and a half minutes to read that. What would it look like for us to regularly, prayerfully engage in a relationship with God through prayer, through practicing time with him. I think it has a ch chance to deepen our relationship with him. Relational depth is built over time. It's portions of time spent over a long period of time. That's how we develop relationships, right? It's small portions of time over time that deepen our relationships with God and with others. You're going to have to put things on a calendar. Scheduling spiritual practices does not make them any less spiritual. Putting a spiritual practice on your calendar doesn't make it less spiritual. It just makes it more likely something that you're going to do. What if we used our uh, calendars and our reminders on our phones to our benefit? What if we use those pieces of technology that if we're honest, we spend a little bit too, time, too much time on? What if we use that technology for our benefit? To put reminders, a reminder in your phone to pray throughout the day, multiple times throughout the day. Just a reminder, pray the Lord's Prayer. Pray the 23rd Psalm. To pray these prayers that, that, that our people have been praying for centuries to develop a relationship with God and with others? What if you set a reminder in your phone to text someone, to have lunch with that person? What if you scheduled a lunch with somebody that you want to deepen your relationship with, to build community? Community is not given to us, right, Laurel? And one of our pastors says that we build community. Community is built. What if we were intentional about that building by putting reminders in our phone, by scheduling the time that it takes to deepen those relationships? What if you used the time you're sitting in, in traffic as a time to listen to a podcast instead of getting frustrated to listen to worship music or maybe to use your time in your car just to turn everything off and be silent long enough for you to hear God's voice, for you to hear his leading you into deeper relationship with him or leading your heart towards someone with whom you are designed to have community. We have time in our lives. I just want to say this one last time and put it up on the screen. The call to live in relationship with God and with others is the call for us to reset our connections by getting real about where we're investing our time and consciously deciding to invest this precious commodity in the places where it will have the most impact. Let's pray. Lord, uh, thank you for the way that you created us, for the way that you designed us, for putting inside of us this desire for relationship, both with you and with others. Lord, um, I pray for each one of us in this room and whoever's listening and watching online, that you will give us the courage that it takes to be real, to be honest about how we're using the time that you've given us 
And not just to be real and honest about how we're using it, but also, God, give us the courage to say no, to change, to make tweaks in how we're investing our time so that we can put it into things that matter the most. And that at the end of the day, we will all have deeper relationships with you and with everyone around us because it's how we've been designed. And I pray this in your name. Amen.